for the sake of our visiting brethren, I, I am going to uh, explain that everyone who has faith in Christ Jesus, if you have a burden for the request that, that we're entering into tonight, uh, you're very welcome. It's not just one person per prayer. It's whoever wants to pray for that particular thing. So please feel free to, to include yourself in these things. Our first request, and they're, re, they're in your bulletin there in the gray area. Our first request this evening is coming from James chapter 5 and verse 16. We're asking that believers everywhere would be righteous and thus able to pray fervent and effectual prayers. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Once in the days of Christ's flesh, uh, I think one of the brethren were, uh, that they actually referenced this, the man that was born blind, and that was his argument, that does God hear sinners? Is, he, he was reasoning with more soundness than those that opposed him and opposed Christ. They wanted to say that Jesus was a sinner. He had healed on the Sabbath, and he, he said, does God hear sinners? Well, they knew the answer to that question. Unfortunately, there is confusion in people's mind today. No, God doesn't hear sinners. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We want to pray fervent, effectual prayers. Amen. We want that uh, not only that God would hear us and that we would continue in a state of infantile lisping, as it were, that we would be able to order our cause before God, that our prayers would be effectual, just not loud and routine. We want to be able to think after the thoughts of God, to reason with Him so that we know that we're asking according to His will, so that we're asking in a manner befitting of the one that we are requesting uh, our petition and we want to be able to be discerning in what is needful. Now that's an effectual prayer, brethren. It doesn't do any good to pray fervently for something that isn't necessary or needful or something that's outside of the will of God. Your, your fervor is wasted. On the other hand, whenever you are discerning, you see something, you want to be able to come to the Lord and to be able to to speak with him in a manner that pleases him, that will, now, I'm not saying whenever I say that will incline him to your request. I'm not talking about flattery or uh, being very clever in your oratory as though we were to um, impress the Lord, but to be able to come to him in a, in a very comely way, spiritually, so that so that God is inclined. Don't think that everybody that voices a prayer that God listens to equally. Would we say that God listened to, uh, to somebody in just the camp of Israel the same as he listened to Moses? I mean, he named by name certain intercessors uh, on occasion. On one occasion, he said, though, Daniel and, and Noah and the other place he said Samuel and, and Moses I mean he knew these men as intercessors and they knew how to come before the Lord and know what to ask and how to present it and they were fervent in it because they had spiritual understanding driving them in this request there's no reason why those who are in Christ are would be devoid of this quality and we would increase and and become um, more effectual if you will in this we want to be righteous because God is righteous and we also want to be able to pray fervent and effectual prayers I don't know about you but praying well I do know about you I shouldn't say that I do know about you but praying is not, not just like one of the so many things that, that 
Christians do. Christians do this, 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 and this. This is the response of a heart of faith to its creator, to its savior, to, to God. He's opened up this, this wonderful, wonderful uh, avenue of communication. We need, we need to speak to him. And we want to be heard. It would be very disheartening to think that whenever we did what we called praying, it was just noise, just unheeded noise. Uh, but we want, we really want to increase in this matter of prayer. Amen. Uh, we want for all of our prayers to be heavy, if you will, whether they be prayers for uh, for an increase of faith for ourselves and others, whether it be prayers of intercession, whether it be prayers of thanksgivings and praises, we want for them to all carry a great amount of weight and for the Lord to be pleased at the hearing of our voice, so to speak. So who will lead us in that request? It'll make us fit for doing kingdom labors. Brother Judah, Brother Jeremy, Brother Tony. All right. Our next request comes from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. And we're praying that all believers would be noted for being holy in all manner of conversation. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. We've worked this word conversation over a time or two, but it bears repeating because uh, it's not used in common vernacular. Your conversation basically is your life. It really is. Your words uh, work in concert with who and what you are in order to form the entire. You're, you're, if you're just talking, you're like an incomplete sentence. The whole thing is the conversation. And so in everything, Believers are to be noted for their holy manner. Why? In another place, God wrote, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Are we the children of God? Well, then we will be like our Father, which is in heaven. This is what glorifies God. This is what is comely to a saint. Anything else is not comely. Anything else is not acceptable. We must, without, it's another place that says, having holiness without which no man shall see God. God is not going to receive an unholy people or person. And he has provided this holiness in his son. We're praying that all believers would be noted. It would be so obvious. See, there's no such thing as private holiness. If you are holy, it's going to be perceived because what's on the inside is worn as it were in your deeds and in your actions and in your words you're clothed upon that unseen part of you is clothed upon with the things that can be seen and discerned by men and angels and so this holiness but the, see the church whenever people say the church I know that people that I'm familiar with that are not, you know, really Christians, or they're just what you'd call uh, people who profess. They're not antagonistic. So if they think if they're not antagonistic, then that makes them a Christian. So, but these people don't think of holiness most commonly. Whenever they think about, they talk about the church, they don't see any contradiction with things that exist in the confines of what calls itself the church and what's just the full-blown world. They really don't see it. This is because, see, this is a very important request. This is because the people of God have not been perceived by everybody, one another, and those that are not believers. Doesn't make any difference across the board. Holiness is the mark of a true believer. And it should be right out there, I mean, neon sign right out there obvious unapologetic 
that pleasing God before pleasing self or men and being holy in all manner of conversation. Nobody should ever walk up behind you unawares and catch a, a person that is a professed believer saying something that they're ashamed of or having an appearance that they're, they're ashamed that that person saw them or anything else. Holiness, real holiness, consistent holiness in public and in private all the time because God is holy all the time. So who will lead us in that request? That we, want, that we talk about that glorious church without spot or wrinkle. This is Christ making his church glorious. That believers would be noted for being holy in all manner of conversation. Who will lead us? Sister Barb, Sister Annie, Brother Judah. Oh, Sister Sue. All right. And then finally, brethren, if you'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll be reading verse 10 and praying that we would all faithfully be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That just sounds good, doesn't it? Amen. Now, I can, I can be strong when it's the Lord's power and when it's the Lord's might because I don't have to, to worry about my failings. All I have to worry about is being in the Lord. Now, having said that, that does take, that does take some effort. Being saved is not like falling off a log. We have to... We have to determine to seek his face. He's worthy of our desire. He's worthy of, of our attention. He's worthy of whatever effort we have to extend in this salvation. We have to make determinations. There'll be times whenever, um, just day-to-day -day life, we have to decide a lot of things. It's a conscious effort to decide with God as our reference rather than ourselves or this world as a reference. It's not hard, but it is, it is a labor. You have, to, you have to want God's attention. You ha want, have to value God's attention. You, you have to want to please him enough that you consider what he wants. So this uh, faithfully be strong in the Lord. If we keep him, the, the things that he's given to us, if we keep them, if we hold them dear in our heart, hold them fast and not depart from them, not allow them to slip away through neglect, not, uh, not allow ourselves to have the world and and the things of the world kind of crowd our thoughts of the Lord, then he will keep us. He will keep us. We couldn't have brought ourselves to where we are now. We didn't have a start that was independent of God, and we won't have a race independent of God, and we won't have a prize independent of God. From start to finish, it is of the Lord. And we would be strong in his might and in the power of his, uh, of his might. Uh, very encouraging. Very encouraging. And again, with this, we need to be mindful and to continue to consider what his power and his might are toward us that believe. And what a, what a, a great thing. There is nothing in heaven and earth that exceeds this power and this might. Nothing that can overcome it. Nothing that can successfully oppose it. Jesus has already gotten the victory. He's already won. We're serving a victorious Savior. Not one that probably will win. He has won. He's already taken dominion to himself. All opposition to him has been manifestly Set, set aside for those that look at things in the spirit and have faith 
and it's just a matter of wrapping it up now. So that's what we live in, the realities of God's power, his might, and the fact that he has already gotten for himself the victory. Who will lead us in that request? Brother Aaron, Sister Sarah, Sister Bailey. Okay. All right, brethren. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll uh, as we lift these prayers, we'll see an evidence of an answer to that first prayer too, about being fervent and effectual in our prayers.